Okay, hello everyone. Um, I think uh, well, I've got uh, just a minute after, so I think we'll get started um, and uh, folks can join us um, as, we, as we progress. Uh, so my name is Nicole Bodner. I'm the communications lead for uh, the Canadian Partnership for Tomorrow project. Uh, welcome and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, uh, which is called One Billion Pieces of Data and Growing, Canada's Living Population Laboratory Overview, Case Studies and Access Guide. Uh, we're very pleased to host this first webinar under the University of Toronto as CPTP's National Coordinating Centre. Before I introduce our speaker, um, let me just give you a couple housekeeping items. Uh, so number one, uh, we'll have time for questions following today's presentation. Uh, to ask a question, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom window uh, and type in your question. Um, if you're having any issues with that, you're welcome to also uh, join us on Twitter um, at CPT Project, um, and I can always ask the question for you there too. Uh, number two, uh, if we can't get to all the questions, you can also reach out to us by email, uh, and we'd be happy to connect with you at info at partnership for tomorrow. And the last housekeeping item, um, all the slides from today's presentation will be available in both French, uh, both in English and French um, on the site following this webinar. So you'll be able to uh, connect with them post. Okay, now let me introduce this presenter, Dr. Philip Awadala. He is the National Scientific Director of CPTP and the Executive Scientific Director of the Ontario Health Study. He is also a Professor of Population and Medical Genomics at the University of Toronto uh, and Director of Genome Canada's uh, Canadian Data Integration Centre. Previously, Dr. Awadala served as Principal Investigator and Director of Quebec's Cartagene. Under his leadership, CPTP has grown into Canada's largest population study with more than 330,000 Canadians in six regional cohorts across the country. Uh, so I'm delighted to turn it over to Philip now. Great. Thanks, Nicole. And thanks, everyone, for joining us this afternoon. Uh, it's afternoon here in Montreal, uh, which is where I'm doing this presentation uh, from today. Um, so today, what I was hoping what we would do uh, with this webinar is this is, if you like, the beginning of a series of webinars that we will be hosting uh, to describe the CPTP. I'm the first of these presenters. Uh, my colleagues uh, in the, the, uh, the other scientific directors in the CPTP will be hosting other webinars, uh, giving updates about uh, other various activities and how you can use the CPTP data. But in today, what I'm hoping to do is largely present to you the, the, the Na Canada's national cohort, the Canadian Partnership for Tomorrow Project, and give you an outline of what we have um, some ways that you can use the data, um, give some examples of that through some case studies, and then show you how you can get access to the data as well. So um, this next, this first slide, I'm trying to get to the next slide here. Um, I don't seem to have control of the slides now. Oh, here we go. Um, so uh, the first slide here is just to remind us that what we're going to be describing here today is a population cohort. And it's a population cohort that we use to study um, how people develop disease with an emphasis, of course, on Canadians. Um, and these are just some numbers associated with chronic diseases as, that are age associated with Canadians and gives you an idea of their frequencies. Um, and as we try to emphasize with the CPTP is that this is effectively a population laboratory. And the reason we emphasize that is that, you know, these population cohorts like other national cohorts and programs like UK Biobank in UK or the All of Us program in the US, we collect, a pop, uh, we collect from the population. We're not collecting data from a clinical cohort or from, uh, from a hospital setting. And what that allows us to do is it allows us to capture variables from participants or information about participants before they develop a disease, which is a great, you know, which is a great asset to these population cohorts or what we call population laboratories. And that emphasizes, if you like, the longitudinal nature of the population cohort as well. We follow participants in the CPTP um, for many years. Um, we show up to 15 years in this slide, but in fact, in the CPTP, we have consented our participants for uh, up to 50 years in some regions. Um, this next slide largely is here to remind you, or remind me to remind you that we do exist. 
and that the CPTP cohort is effectively Canada's population cohort supporting precision health or precision medicine studies. Um, I don't know if Andre Picard knows that I use them as a straw man like this, but nonetheless, it is important for us to get the word out that we're here and we want the Canadian and international community to come in and utilize the data. And so hopefully after today, um, this, uh, you'll be hearing some things that might be of value for your different, your specific research programs. And so I'll, I'll get right into it. The CPTP or the Canadian Partnership for Tomorrow is a, is a partnership. Um, this is our mission or vision statement, if you like. It's a population health research platform um, supporting research in the genetics, behavior, environmental health history space um, as it relates to not just diseases, but also to biology and to the biology of disease as well. And, you know, this program started, uh, you know, the first person walked in the door, in fact, in some of our regions, and I'll get into how, what makes up the CPTP. Uh, I think in 2007 and 2008, Quebec and Alberta were the first out of the gate to begin recruiting participants into the cohort. Um, and from 2008 to 2015, we were largely building our baseline. Um, and our baseline recruitment ended somewhere in 2014, and we started allowing researchers to come in and use the data in 2015. Um, at the very top of this figure, you see something called the New Scientific Leadership Establishment. And that establishment allows us, it's, it's a function of the fact that um, the CPTP is now residing um, in the, um, in, at the University of Toronto uh, in the Ontario Institute of Cancer Research. And it uh, now has a scientific leadership that includes myself as the scientific director and John McLaughlin as the executive director with an executive that makes up, uh, that is made up of our uh, regional scientific directors in each of, each of the different provinces as well. Um, so this is a slide just describing that this is a partnership across, of nine provinces that have recruited so far 320,000 participants. And from these 320,000 participants, um, and growing. In fact, you're going to see some slight num changes in numbers here with these 320,000 because I, I actually believe we're uh, uh, growing day by day. Um, in some regions now, Manitoba coming online, for example, um, is now in the and we're recruiting participants in baseline. And we're capturing health data, biological samples from these participants. Some participants are invited to, to, uh, to particular sites where we can capture physical measures. And then we have many activities where we're looking at longitudinal follow-ups with respect to health and other related uh, and other uh, activities related to that. Um, these are the partners uh, in the partnership. Uh, so from east to west, we include the Atlantic Path, which has included within the Atlantic cohort four different provinces. So they have a lot of activity there with respect to these four different provinces and linking participants to administrative health records in those provinces. I mentioned Quebec before. Uh, Cartagena is the Quebec cohort, which has recruited 43,609 participants. The Ontario Health Study, which I'm also the scientific director of, is, has recruited 213,000 participants, 150,000 are part of the CPTP. Some people in the Ontario Health Cohort fall outside of the age range of the CPTP, but if you're interested in those participants and outside of that age range, uh, we're certainly interested in talking to you there. Uh, I mentioned Cancer Care Manitoba. Uh, Manitoba has now come online and beginning recruitment. Um, there's a gap here in the middle with Saskatchewan, and every time I give a webinar or a talk somewhere, somebody's always asking me well, what's going on with Saskatchewan. It's not that we're leaving them out. Uh, we are now in discussion to begin uh, to potentially bring uh, Saskatchewan online. Uh, Alberta's Tomorrow Project is also one of our older cohorts as well. It started around recruitment around the same time as the Quebec cohort and has similar numbers of participants as in Quebec. And BC Generations Project has recruited about 30,000 participants. Uh, each of these regions has a scientific director um, uh, that supports the activity and operations in those, in those regions. But together, uh, we make up the CPTP participant cohort. And together, uh, we effectively, you can have access to this data through various mechanisms by which, uh, where I'll describe some of those activities. And as I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, the CPTP is now jointly housed. Uh, we have our National Coordinating Center at the University of Toronto and the OICR in Toronto as well. Um, there's a lot of words on this slide, but I'm going to get to a lot of this in this presentation today. Um, we have many different uh, uh, kinds of information in the CPTP, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this particular side. Um, you're hopefully going to get a, a better handle on this. One of the things that I wanted to mention, and I know that I don't have a slide of this later, is that we now have not just information from our participants coming from things like questionnaires, physical measures, 
biologics, et cetera, but we also have MRIs. And MRIs, oh, we don't have any information for that coming up, but that has, that's a recent activity uh, spearheaded by uh, Sonia Nan and Matthias Friedrich and Jack too. And uh, we are very soon going to be able to make that kind of information available as well. Um, oh yes, and just before I move on, I wanna mention that anything that you're hearing today um, to some extent is described in our marker paper, which was published last year in the Canadian Medical Association Journal in 2018. And that's that citation at the very bottom left with Trevor Dummer, who is the, uh, one of the leads in BC as the first author there, it includes all the authors uh, in the CPTP as well. Um, so one of the things that I wanna emphasize with this presentation today is that this is a longitudinal cohort. And in the, with a longitudinal cohort, we can support uh, both retrospective and prospective science. Um, with retrospective science, I mean that we can use, say, information that we've captured with questionnaire data, administrative health data, et cetera, to see what leads to a particular disease. Um, and as, as well, we're following our participants over time, and that's the prospective nature of the, of the cohorts as well. Um, something that I also want to emphasize, we capture lots of information from our participants. We've got blood, uh, blood, we include uh, measures of uh, variables from the blood that we capture from serum as well. I'm not going to go through all of these variables. Um, I will be making this deck available and you can capture find some of this information on our CPTP website. Uh, physical measures from our participant and from both uh, the questionnaires as well as linkages through other program. I'll talk about the CANOE program later on. Uh, we capture environmental measures as well. But you can see here that we capture a lot of information from our participants, particularly in say the cell count space, um, things that we can measure from blood directly, et cetera. Um, from, with physical measures, when participants are invited to a clinical site, um, these are the kinds of things that we capture with respect to physical measures. We have this information from about 100,000 of our participants. So if you like, we've deeply phenotyped or, or characterized a large number of our, our participants in the CPTP, over almost 100,000 participants here. And again, um, just emphasizing at the very bottom, we've got about MRIs now and about 10,000 participants. But again, you can see here that um, one of the things that we like to do is if you're interested in these measures, um, we will make available the, how the measure was collected or the variable was collected as well. Um, this is a very quick schematic of blood samples that we've collected. In general, we have DNA so source material for uh, genetic or genomic experiments from almost 160,000 participants. They overlap with those individuals I just mentioned where we have physical measures, um, blood, saliva, urine, et cetera, uh, has been captured. I showed this slide here from <coughs> Cartagen, because Cartagen has some deep, has perhaps the most blood from each participant that they've captured. Um, and you can see how well they fractionated it. But we have, very, in, in the different regions, we have similar sort of protocols uh, for how we store samples, et cetera. <coughs> Um, okay, so what I'm going to do next in the next couple of slides is just give some kind of overview of some of the things that we've captured with data uh, from the data from each of our participants. So things like overall perception of health status, we have some information from our 300,000 participants. So here's a, just a pie chart, a simple pie chart from that kind of information captured, and that's in our, also in our CPTP um, marker paper. These are some of the prevalent conditions, uh, the self-reported conditions of a number of diseases or chronic diseases as well as or outcomes in our cohort. So I, you know, I like to highlight some of the big ones like diabetes, type two diabetes in particular is around 21,000. A number of prevalent cancers uh, is around almost 30,000. Uh, hypertension or high, is associated with high blood pressure. Uh, we have about 70,000 participants uh, where we've got, uh, where we've got a, 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 a self-reported information with uh, there. Um, and in many of these, for many of these variables, we, if you like, validate the information, particularly for cancers, uh, with our linkages to administrative health records. Um, so uh, I'll talk about that in a moment. One of the things I want to highlight is where is Canada on the international stage now, or where is CPTP, if you like, in the international stage. And now that we have a cohort of in the hundreds of thousands, we've been effectively invited to a number of what are now growing or new international uh, consortium that you will hear about very soon if you haven't already. Um, I'm highlighting two, uh, the International 100,000 Cohort Consortium. Um, I'm on the steering committee with that with a colleague, Thomas Keene at EBI. And then the International Common Disease Alliance, which is being spearheaded out of the Broad, uh, Eric Lander is, is driving that activity as well. 
And these are an example of the cohorts that are part of the, both of those projects. Um, these are cohorts where they only, rec they, where uh, there's at least 100,000 participants in these cohorts. And uh, to some extent, you can't be part of these, these programs without having a cohort of at least that size or number. Um, and largely because uh, these are the cohorts that are perhaps large enough and reflective enough to, to capture information at a large national scale. There are many, many cohorts that are out there of value that are less than 100,000 in size, um, but these are the largest ones that are out there and they're part of these programs. Um, this is just a picture here uh, from the International 100,000 Cohort Consortium and a map if you like. And so finally Canada gets to join the map here of, uh, of, these, of these national, international partners as well. So the plan here is to link phenotypic data and genotypic data across these cohorts. And we're hoping to leverage an activity that we've already actually already started here in Canada called the CHIPIT, or the Cross Cohort Harmonization Project that we started with CPAC funding and with our partners at Maelstrom, which has already started this activity of harmonizing variables, or at least building data dictionaries or atlases data atlas for many of the cohorts that I just mentioned, um, and these are just a sampling of those cohorts, such that individuals can look up variables if you like and see whether your variable of interest is in these different projects as well. So I'm going to leave the international where we are on the international stage and kind of move back to what is Canada doing and what are we doing with the CPTP, and I'm going to come back to our, some of our major activities with respect to linkages. And this is just a slide to kind of describe and mention the linkage activities that are ongoing with the CPTP data now. Um, all of the CPTP participants, or almost all of them, have consented to allowing us to link um, at the national and provincial level to various administrative health record uh, projects or data sets or organizations, um, as well as to other projects like uh, the Canoe Project, which is currently building environment data. Um, so I'm going to talk about both of those. And I'm going to use a case study to describe how we're doing that and why we're doing that. So in Ontario, for example, um, much of the linkages that we're talking about uh, with CPTP have to happen provincially. There are national activities that one can develop and we're trying to build those partnerships uh, presently. But much of the administrative health record data linkages are having to happen uh, provincially. So I'm giving a case example of something that's happening in Ontario with the Ontario Health Study, where we have a partnership with the Cancer Care Ontario group. And with Cancer Care Ontario, we're, we, are, we have exchanged information such that we can identify uh, participants within this OHS on the Ontario Health Study who have um, developed a cancer. So this helps us validate self-reported outcomes and also can help us identify individuals who came into the cohort healthy and then have since developed a cancer. And why that's important is that because what we potentially have within the Ontario Health Study are, is, is data and biologics where we have information before somebody develops a cancer and we might be able to identify a factor or a diagnostic or some sort of signature in that data that might lead to us uh, detecting perhaps earlier than a traditional early a traditional diagnosis, that signature of a cancer. So this is just how we have to kind of do this. And to some extent, this case study exemplifies anybody's um, activity with respect to doing linkages with CPTP. So in my lab, we had to get an REB approval, get a Cancer Care Ontario access request, send data over from the Ontario Health Study. That gets linked by Cancer Care Ontario to various records, so OCR, is the Ontario Cancer Registry. Um, we're getting information about path records, pathology records, et cetera. And that data comes back to us at the OICR. And that allows us, like I said, to capture prevalent cancers or cancers which were already uh, reported by the participant in the Ontario Health Study, as well as incident cancers or cancers where the participant hadn't reported to us that they had been diagnosed, but we now have identified them as now being a new cancer patient somewhere in Ontario. Um, so this gives us some numbers uh, that we currently have so far. Uh, we've got about 178 participants who have a blood malignancy, 354 that these are incident cancers uh, with prostate cancer and 425 um, with, uh, with uh, breast cancer and 21 new pancreatic cancer patients. And this figure is giving you an idea of the kind of information that we're now able to capture. Um, the, uh, the legend at the bottom shows uh, the, three, um, the three different colors here where we have a time of an event when we captured a blood sample 
when that diagnosis had occurred and that, that was captured in, say, the Ontario Cancer Registry, and when did we get a questionnaire information? And so an incident case would be something like here, where the diagnosis happened after we collected, say, a blood sample or questionnaire or information uh, came to us. So again, that speaks to this project, which we'd like to do, which is try to look and interrogate um, the questionnaire and blood data to see if there was a signature of that cancer before that initial diagnosis. Um, not much to say about this slide here, except uh, what we're seeing, of course, over time is that an, we're seeing an accumulation of incident prevalent cancers in the OHS, as we expect as our participants age. And so this information has now been used by, um, this kind of information has now been used by researchers um, locally here in Toronto. Uh, uh, John Dick has been spearheading with Laurent Schlusch at Princess Margaret. Um, use of this incident case information um, to capture signatures in blood um, up to 10 years before traditional diagnosis ar around AML or acute myelo myeloid leukemia. Um, so this is just a, a slide here. Uh, if you like showing the kinds of things that we're looking at. Um, so we have funding now with, with John and from various sources where we're interested in capturing the signatures of early somatic mutations uh, largely in stem, that accrue in stem cells that may lead to AML. Um, so that's something called CHIP, uh, clonal hematopoiesis. And this just speaks again to the value of a population cohort that in our population cohort, we have a lot of blood that speaks to um, these somatic mutations that are accruing um, before a traditional diagnosis. So uh, John's team uh, using data from the EPIC cohort, for example, um, were able to capture high allele frequencies of mutations in participants who are pre-leukemic versus uh, those that are found here in controls at specific, at specific genes, dnm 23 is if you like a hotspot for leukemia and they're seeing and ASXL, et cetera. And these, these participants who are pre-leukemic have higher allele frequencies, variant allele frequencies compared to um, our, uh, our controls over here. So this is a project that's now underway within the OHS using uh, a lot of the, the Cancer Care Ontario information that I had described before. Um, so, uh, Sagi Abelson, who's now a PI at the OICR, um, is the first author on this type of project where you can, we're describing how you can effectively capture these types of signatures from blood. Okay, so that's how we, uh, some people are using linking uh, administrative health record data to, um, <clears throat> to, uh, to our uh, population cohort information. I'm going to focus in now on a new project which is, link, is, which is spearheading linking environmental data to our participants, and that's, a, that's another case study that I'm going to describe. Um, Jeff Brook is the lead PI of a, and there's like six others, uh, not just myself, uh, who are PIs on a program called the CANOE program, or the Canadian Urban Environmental Health Research Consortium, which is a consortium to build a platform where we can take participants from the CPTP and other cohorts, particularly the child cohort um, in, and target kids, I believe, in Canada, as well as the CLSA, Canadian Longitudinal Study for, for Aging. Um, and in those cohorts, we have three and six digit postal codes from our participants, and we can use that information to link to environmental um, exposures. And so that's what Canoe is now driving at. Um, and those exposures are largely speaking to things like, you know, air and water pollution, exposures due to radiation, if you like, and radiation meaning, say, uh, the sun, et cetera. Uh, we're capturing lots of other things in canoe, like walkability indices, um, air quality, noise, et cetera. Um, so I'm gonna talk about how we've used that information um, to understand, say, genetic by environmental determinants associated with, um, uh, associated with um, some, say, exposures to these, out these types of outcomes, these, ex these types of exposures, and how they relate to outcomes. And I'm going to focus in on uh, the kind of data we've been also collecting such that we can interrogate the G by E or the genetics by environment to, uh, to see how they interact to contribute to out, uh, phenotypic outcomes. And to some extent, I think this is the real power of a population cohort like CPTB, because not only do we capture genomic information and genetic variation like genotyping data, but we've also collected enough kind of samples such that we can interrogate the transcriptome 
Uh, we have projects that are interrogating the metabolome now, and, some, uh, and we have cytokines, inflammatory markers that are being captured in the CPTP. And so that we, they, we can look at how all of these things interact with the environment to, to produce phenotypic outcomes. Um, one of the things I want to highlight is some of the genomic data has already appeared in publication and is already available. Most of this is coming so far out of Quebec because they were the first out of the gate. Um, so they've appeared in paid publications like Nature Genetics and in Science, um, and, but they are now available uh, to the research community. Um, and they have to be uh, both because of our policies in the CPTV that the data become available, as well as the policies according to publications as well. But I do want to highlight that we will be finished, we are in, uh, actively genotyping and performing other genomics, and I'll come back to that later uh, for the rest of the CPTP as well. Um, so just to highlight some of the publications that already come out, uh, there's a publication that appeared in Science that used, that, uh, that uh, utilized a, a thousand high coverage transcriptomes to understand metabolomics, sorry, to understand mitochondrial RNA variation and how that relates to uh, metabolism. Um, also genomics from uh, the uh, French Canadians uh, that's been genotyping and exome sequencing, as well as RNA sequencing that allows us to look at how genetic variation is distributed in French Canadians compared to say the French. Um, you can see this in these publications in Nature Genetics and PLOS Genetics. Um, and one thing I want to highlight is uh, in, in this case study that I'm going to describe is how we've used this genomics to look at G by E. So how do we interrogate uh, how the environment interacts with your genome to produce outcomes? And so this, is, this appeared in a publication uh, predominantly in a Nature Communications publication last year in 2000, uh, 2018. Um, and we've been developing tools with our collaborators um, at, at Stanford, that's Stephen Montgomery and Johns Hopkins, Alexis Battle, that allows you to, uh, to use this kind of information to integrate um, this data. So in that case study, we had uh, genomics uh, data from Montreal participants, Quebec City participants, and SAGNE, so that's what these abbreviations stand for. Uh, and we were interested in not, not only understanding how does genetic variation vary amongst these cities, and so that's what we're showing you here. And what you'll see from genotyping data in Quebec is that it follows a very nice kind of cline. Um, this is just a principal component analysis of the genotypic variation in the population. So blue are participant uh, genotypes from par uh, participants in SAGNE uh, versus that of Montreal versus that in Quebec. And you can actually you know, map that down to a three digit postal code resolution, which is what we're just showing you here. That's all this is showing here in this map where actually SAGNE has got cut off and it's up to be somewhere up here. So we're seeing genetic variation is actually fairly well structured. I was really surprised by this. I thought I was impressed with the fact that even from only a couple thousand individuals that we were able to capture this kind of degree of stratification within just Quebec. Um, but not only do we see gen genotypic stratification, so that's this genotypic line, but when we look at RNA sequencing from whole blood, and we can do that with the CPTP blood samples or some of the CPTP blood samples, we see that there's also a transcriptomic line. So what we're seeing here for genotypes almost is recapitulated or mirror, is mirrored in transcriptomics. So how genes are expressed or turned on or off seems to also follow a geographic line. And so what my postdoc, Mary-Julie Fabé, who's at, uh, with me in the lab still, and she also sits at Montreal Heart Institute, uh, was interested in looking at was how does that differential, how do genes get differentially expressed depending on which city and your ancestry? So which city you live in and what, what is your ancestral background? Meaning that if you were ancestrally from Segne, for example, and you've now lived now live in Montreal, do you show the gene expression signature of somebody living in Montreal versus your ancestry? And in fact, the answer is that where you live matters most more than what your genotype, in fact. That, for example, if you're now living in Montreal, but you're ancestrally from, say, Quebec or, Mon or Segne, your gene expression signature mirrors that of your locale versus that of um, your ancestry. So that led us to ask, what is it, that we c what is it about where you live um, that contributes to that gene expression variability in the population? And so this now relates back to the CANOE project, where they've come captured this kind of information um, within canoe, NO2, SO2, uh, PM2.5. This is all air, air, air pollution information. And we see that in our participants in Quebec, for example, that participants in Segne cluster differently with respect to air pollution and all these other environmental variables compared to people from Quebec 
versus Montreal, Quebec and Montreal, a little bit more uh, intermixed, if you like, in this figure, but the people from Saguenay are definitely st um, uh, uh, sitting out as outliers. And so it suggests then to us that air pollution in particular um, seems to be driving some of this gene expression variation. And if you like, a lot of the, the top 500 differentially expressed genes in, this, in, the, in these Quebec participants, a lot of them have to do with oxygen transport and inflammatory response. Of course, this speaks to the fact that we're looking at gene expression from blood. Um, and we've integrated this information with genomics or genotyping data to capture genetic variants or EQTLs that are associated with uh, gene expression. Um, again, if you're interested, this is actually uh, part of the publication, Nature Communication. I, won't, I don't have time to get too much into this today, but uh, we can ask what, uh, as, um, uh, we, can, we can always answer questions if you're interested. And so this just summarizes some of that information, how we're looking at endo environment endophenotypes, transcriptome, we think of as an endophenotype, and look at that, how it, how it relates to genotype, and show how it relates to inflammatory, inflammatory pathways. And just here, this, this, is some, we, we, this caught the attention of our media in Canada, so the Globe and Mail captured this, uh, found this article, and this, uh, that we uh, had some uh, press uh, fairly recently. Okay, so where is CPT going? Uh, strategic priorities for the next five years. Uh, these are outlined, well, not necessarily five years, uh, we've outlined these strategic priorities back in 2017, is to continue enrichment of the cohort with biomarkers. We are hoping by uh, the end of this fiscal year that we will have now completed almost 50,000 genotypes in the entire for, the, for CPTP. All of Quebec will have been genotyped um, by the end of this fiscal. Uh, we will have uh, genotyped across the rest of Canada another um, <clears throat> another 20,000 participants, and in the next uh, and we're hoping to get more of that uh, more um, genotyping done in the following fiscal. Um, we've also started a sequencing activity this year as well, whole genome sequencing of our participants as well. Um, and I've outlined things that we're already doing with linking to environmental data. We're collecting through questionnaires information about follow, follow up health follow up questionnaires from our participants. Um, and information about residential and occupational histories. And as I mentioned before, in all of the provinces, I mentioned Ontario, but in all of the provinces, activities are ongoing to link CPTP participants to administrative health records versus with activities, say, for example, BC Cancer Agency, Alberta Health Services, et cetera. Um, I'm going to end off this seminar, uh, this webinar, uh, talking about the, uh, how you can get access um, there is a CPTP portal. This is it. Um, we have a refresh uh, upcoming. Uh, this, the, the portal is always being updated. Um, here you'll get description about the CPTP portal. Uh, it provides you information about how the cohort was designed, the data sets, uh, the kind of biological samples that are available. We want to emphasize that biological samples, not just data, but biological samples are available to the research community. Um, we have perhaps a higher threshold for allowing them to be used by the research community, but nonetheless, they are, are available. And we office, and they are available through our access process. Um, there's a portal. Um, this, is the, you know, this is the first thing you'll see. Actually, if you, this the screenshot is the first thing you will see if you uh, uh, open up the CPTP portal. And here, in fact, you'll see how participants or a variable may be captured as it relates to a CPTP and as it relates to CANOE, information that we've got back from CANOE for example, say dwelling density and so on. So you can search that portable, that portal, sorry. Um, but as well, you can get, uh, we would like, if, if you were interested in getting access to the actual data from the participants, there is an access process. It's fairly similar to other access processes that people may be familiar with, say at UK Biobank or other programs. Um, so you'll have information about that access process and you don't, I'm not gonna go through each of these steps if you like. Um, but there's, you know, you create an account, you can submit a request. Uh, we suggest before coming in, but it's not critical to have an REB or an ethics approval. Um, and it's also helpful if you've, got, you've been peer reviewed, but it's not also uh, limiting. Um, there, this is the, uh, the uh, how we make access to the samples. Uh, there's an access committee, there's an access office that supports researchers. So please use our access office. Uh, they're there to help you um, uh, with, your, with your access requests. So I'm just going to end off uh, talking about uh, why, to some extent, uh, summarizing what we've discussed, uh, but, uh, you know, emphasizing why we've built a population cohort. And, uh, you know, population cohorts are obviously important because 
we capture lots of information from many, many people, um, and their impact, of course, uh, can be large uh, or small. Um, and so we can, in the CPTP, we've been capturing information like the things that I've been talking about with respect to environmental exposures, information phenotypic and physical measures like CBCs, et cetera. And that allows us to ask questions around genetics and environment. Um, within the CPTP, of course, it's not just a population core. We have many outcomes. Um, and so we support lots of research in that space as well. Um, so we can support, if you like, uh, case control studies as well. We do have 300,000 participants, so it allows you to stratify and design an experiment so that you're not necessarily having to use the entire 300,000. And of course, and I haven't talked about this today, we can support, because we do allow biologics to, if you like, be used by our researchers um, to look at things like cellular processes. Uh, in, my, within my own team, we have uh, pro projects which are look, using single cell applications to understand how, say, blood cells change with age and how they contribute to diseases as well. And that's just all we're showing you here. So we're using 10x uh, a single cell RNA-seq and attack-seq to capture this kind of information as well. Um, so that's uh, the end of the webinar. So I think, would like to thank you for joining me today. Um, and I'm happy to, th I'm thanking all of our participants as well as uh, um, the many, many people who are involved in the build of the CPTP project. Um, there are, like I said, five regional PIs in each of the, co uh, amongst the different cohorts specifically. Uh, and there, are re uh, there have been PIs who are no longer with the cohort, but were instrumental in bringing the project together. Um, and I also want to uh, thank our sponsors. Uh, this is a consortium of just not regions, but funding as well. In Canada, this is, this is somewhat critical to our, be, our being able to develop this program. And so we've, uh, we're very appreciative of the funding that we received both from national as well as provincial partners. So uh, thanks uh, everyone. And I'm gonna turn this over to Nicole, um, who's going to help facilitate um, the questions. I think I have yeah, two up here as well. So I'm just gonna pull that down here. Okay, absolutely. Philip, th thank you so much. Um, just uh, let's just take a short pause here. Um, to those who joined us a few minutes into the webinar, um, allow me to remind everyone, uh, if you'd like to ask uh, Philip a question, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom window uh, and type in your question. Uh, for anyone on Twitter, um, I'm monitoring that as well. Uh, if you'd like to uh, tweet at us or send us a direct message, um, I'd be happy to convey questions via Twitter. Um, or the third option, uh, you welcome to reach out to us at info at partnershipfortomorrow.ca, and we'll be happy to connect with you. Um, and you know, if you have any suggestions or ideas uh, for future webinar topics, I invite you to email us here as well. Uh, another reminder that the slides from today's presentation will be available in both English and French on the CPT website following this webinar. Uh, oh, and I see we've got oh quite a few questions in here. Um, so I'll turn it back over to Philip now. Great. Uh, I'm getting lots of email at the same time as, as these questions coming up, but I'll just focus in on the ones that are coming in via, uh, via this, by the, the Zoom app. So, uh, so David has asked about serum samples, so I'm just going to read this off. Uh, in addition to serum samples, do you also have plasma samples available for study? Uh, the answer is yes. Everything that you saw um, on, the, on, the, on this deck um, are available for researchers to have access to. Uh, we like to emphasize, though, that because the samples are finite, um, uh, we evaluate the, um, the use of those samples uh, fairly carefully. Uh, as a group um, and uh, through our, both our both the regional scientific directors as well as the access committee as well. So the answer to that is yes. Um, and I believe we also have plasma samples that are already being used in some, for some projects. Uh, the next two questions are related, I think, how do you get, well, how do you get access to the link samples through the national cohort? Um, so Michelle is asking that and so Michelle, you, would, you can get that through the CPTP activity itself, through the CPTP portal. Um, so there is an access process that way. Again, there's a team there to help you with that. And how well is CPTP harmonized with other international cohorts? That's a great question. And so I did spend a bit of time uh, emphasizing the International 100,000 Cohort Consortium. We are now, as I said, working and uh, is having a lot of conversations with, uh, with Isabel Portier at Maelstrom about how, how to do this. 
Um, we have a number of activities or projects that uh, have already been funded, um, not necessarily to us, but we're trying to work as a team uh, with these other funded activities. But the, the main aim of SETI IHCC is to effectively build a mega cohort to determine how harmonized we can do this uh, internationally as well. Um, and we're hoping to have something demonstrable um, by uh, maybe the end of this fiscal year as well, um, almost in the form of a portal, but that's subject to some, some more uh, planning and discussion. Uh, Frida uh, Lona Dorazo has asked, uh, given the diversity in Canada and especially, especially in Ontario, do you plan to include also non-European ancestry participants? Um, uh, yes, uh, so in CPTP, uh, there is no ex inclusion or, or exclusion criteria. Um, to some extent, we are at the whim, if you like, of the participant in terms of which participants have signed up. We do recognize that C uh, both cohorts like us and other cohorts tend to be fairly European in, in, in nature. Um, so there was some emphasis on to try to get in non-European uh, participants uh, to sign up. And in fact, the MRI project that Sonia Nan uh, was leading actually focused in uh, uh, on trying to get as many uh, uh, to enrich it with uh, uh, non-Europeans as well. Uh, this, is a, this is an emphasis uh, that we are very, uh, th we're thinking a lot about. Um, our plan going forward for say genotyping is to just genotype everybody. And in that case, we don't have to think, we don't have to consider or think about the ancestries of our participants as well. Um, Aline Taluk, is there a way to identify and access tumor material from cancer incident cases for cancer subtyping? Another great question. Um, this comes up a lot. And so Kimberly Skeet, a PhD student in the lab who's working very closely with our Cancer Care Ontario colleagues is working hard to get that kind of information from CCO. Um, but this has come up nationally as well. Uh, we've had these conversations in BC and Alberta. So Trevor Dummer and Par Parveen, um, who lead the, the, uh, the BC program, have been looking at how and how the consents will work with respect to uh, particular people who have been consented into the, uh, the various cohorts, as well as consented to allowing their tumors to be um, used for science. So uh, we're spending a lot of time finding those tumor samples as well. And uh, we're hoping that that material can be used by a number of researchers as well as consortia as well. Um, is there a cost related to accessing genetic samples? Uh, the simple question, the simple answer to it is yes, it's fully cost recovery um, uh, model. Um, I'm not gonna get into the cost because I always kind of mess this up, um, but generally the cost recovery is on the cost of how much it was to not extract the full sample, but to extract some of the sample as well as ship the sample, et cetera. So uh, yes, there is a, a minor cost per sample uh, for that. And I would recommend uh, accessing, uh, contacting the CPTB um, access and they'll, they'll point you to those costs. Um, in the access, Yin Yang has asked, is, in the access portal, is legal representative contact info a must or we could bypass this question? Um, thanks. So I think that legal representative refers specifically to who's going to be signing off at your institution. Um, so initially it doesn't have to be there um, in your access, in your initial access request. Um, but by the time you're at the point of getting data, you should have somebody who's uh, authorized on behalf of your institution to uh, um, sign the, if you like, the, the contract or the MOU or the MTA, et cetera, when getting the data. Uh, we do need to have something at that point but it doesn't have to be there right at the initial, uh, at the, at the initial access request. Uh, thanks, Stephanie. Uh, how was diet measured? Um, so diet is an act, uh, is, was initially done in Quebec uh, with a food frequency questionnaire and is still a subject of uh, continuing uh, capture. Um, right now, Alberta is spearheading that activity, I can say. Um, and so Jennifer Vena, who's the lead out of Alberta, is the, um, is driving that activity. She's a real specialist in this space. Um, some years ago now, uh, about three or four years ago, we had developed a Canadianized version of the food frequency questionnaire with collaborators at the NIH. And uh, that's how the Quebec data was, was captured and it's being now updated, I think as well. Uh, and uh, 
That may not be captured across all of Canada, but it'll be captured amongst a large number of participants. So if you want data now, there's certainly data available in Quebec, but soon there'll be data captured, more data information captured in places like Alberta and other, and other provinces. Um, how are we doing for time, Nicole? There are a lot of questions. <laughs> uh, we've still, I mean, it's um, about quarter two, so we still have about 15 minutes or so, 14 minutes, so we could keep on going. Okay, great. Um, so Francis has asked, I, I, uh, I'm trying to do this as quickly as the, this kind of keep rolling, scrolling off the screen. This is kind of great. Uh, what social determinants of health, health factors have CPTP included in the data set? For example, I looked at the data definition for gender and it only covers male and female. Uh, what about the gender diverse categorization? There are different values being proposed. Are there, I think that meant, to, that was meant to be, are there different values being proposed? Uh, yes. Um, in fact, what I might point you to, Francis, is that within the Ontario Health Study in particular, there was information captured on gender as well as sex. Um, and I believe that was also captured in many of the courts. You might, that might take a bit of a deeper dive with some of the access uh, to our access uh, portal. But I know for sure in Ontario Health Study, um, I wasn't in charge of that recruitment act, uh, when that was developed. Um, but I know for sure that that, that, was, that was an important uh, a, uh, those were important variables that were being asked of the participants as well. Uh, Melanie Courtauld uh, is calling, uh, writing from uh, EBI. Have you looked into changes in gene expression over time as participants move places? Example from Montreal to Saguenay. What is the time frame within changes occur where changes occur at? Um, that's a great question because I get I do get asked that, and so we are now. What we're now doing, I can't say that that's so straightforward to do because we don't actually have information of, on all our participants about when somebody moved from, say, Saguenay to Montreal. Uh, I remember, uh, get, I get that uh, question almost every single time. One thing that we are looking at that were longitudinal gene expression profiles for almost a thousand participants within Cartagen. So we're going to see how stable these gene expression profiles are and be able to also capture some more information with respect to be like the, the ephemeral nature of those, how, can, how, how stable are those gene expression uh, signatures and, do we, um, and we'll get some information about how people move as well. Uh, Karina Kowalak has asked, uh, can you walk us through the basic timeline and costs associated with data access for, for researchers? Um, that is variable, Karina, and that's going to depend on, on what you're requesting. We are trying to expedite data access such that a data access request should be more streamlined than say um, a request for biologics. Uh, I can't say that we're as streamlined as we'd like, but I will say, it, and it is variable with respect to the kind of information you're asking. If you're largely just asking for information about, say, things associated with questionnaires, that's not going to take too long. It may just take a couple of months. Um, and access might be close to just the costs associated with the access registration fees, and there's a minor access fee for the data itself. Um, the uh, and again, those are fairly small. Uh, when you access, I, will, I do want to emphasize, and this is the nature of working in Canada, um, and the sad nature of working in Canada is that we still require that if you're interested in linking to administrative health record data, um, that that requires regional access requests. We can help support that at CPTP, but to some extent, depending on what you're looking for, you're almost better off um, to, or be, it's more expeditious, if you like, to go to each of the regions as well. Um, and with that said, uh, we are working to improve that with our collaborations with national activities like Statistics Canada, Chi High, et cetera. We're also trying to improve that by creating derived variables that we can host locally, uh, sorry, at CPTP. Uh, uh, Lihai or Lihi at Eater has asked, uh, is it possible to link CPTP to administrative data stored in I, um, ISIS or ICES, sorry, with OHIP claims to create cohorts of specific diseases? And the, and the short answer to that is yes. Um, that linkage has happened already. Um, in fact, was one of the first things that we did to validate, if you like, the quality of the Ontario data, um, as well as some of our ca cancer outcomes. So that data already resides within the ICES. 
And we have tried to streamline that access procedure such that you only have to apply through ICES to get access to OHS data and participants. Of course, we will oversee that access request at the OHS when it goes through. Um, Amit Deshwar has asked, what is the timeline for WGS data being available? Ha. So uh, that is a lot of that is funding uh, dependent. Um, we, are, we are trying to do this uh, uh, and one of the reasons why I'm in Montreal today. Um, but uh, uh, right now we are a very large cohort of, uh, of biologics and there are not a lot of other activities, UK Biobank being one of the few others, which is already, and all of us are now thinking about their what their plans are for whole genome sequencing. Um, some of the whole genome sequencing uh, will be made available very soon. Some of the, uh, we will have the first couple thousand from Quebec available by the end of this year. Um, hopefully um, there's funding already available from that that Genome Quebec has confirmed. Um, we are trying to get more of the samples from, uh, uh, from many of the other provinces available uh, within the next couple of years. So double, well, whole genome sequencing is an ambition. Um, genotyping will be online much more soon, uh, much more, uh, uh, it will be available more, uh, more, uh, more quickly than the, the whole genome sequencing, and that's largely because of cost. Um, Francis Lau, how much data from primary care EMR systems have you linked? I'm thinking of the CPCSN networks with 11 networks. Um, that would require, I think, to answer that, um, uh, almost, I think, a direct interrogation by researchers like yourself. Um, I don't know if I can answer that um, right off the bat. Uh, I think with respect to primary care, we don't do much of that. Largely, most of the linkage that we are doing is through activities like Cancer Care Ontario, ICES, et cetera, which is, um, and, in, uh, and our consents are largely to administrative health records and not necessarily directly to the EMR systems themselves. So I would think that the answer to that is not much, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that there aren't some data that you could get access to, but largely we're working with registries, um, which to some extent helps us because we don't have all of those resources and there are people who are great at collecting that information at those organizations like I just mentioned and collating them in. But I agree that, I, I agree that a lot of people are more, uh, are wanting to, um, get access to that information. And I think that's an ambition for us to think about in the future. Uh, Sierra Thomas, is there a way to estimate number of cancer specific cases, pancreatic prior to creating an account? For instance, is this information publicly available? Um, so the answer is uh, yes. Um, I can tell you from pancreatic, obviously the rates are small for pancreatic. Um, we can capture some of our prevalent cancers or numbers for you. Um, with respect to incident cancers like, I, that, like that that I described within, uh, within the case study here, that would require, um, I'd have to think a little bit about that because we, we, I, I want to make sure that we don't overstep our access agreements with Cancer Care Ontario, et cetera, and other, the other agencies, but generally we can give some rough estimates, I think, on our incident cancers. So I'm not too concerned about giving a ballpark number with that respect to that. Um, Vicky Kirsch, have you faced barriers in sharing the linked data with the cohort consortia? So that again relates to uh, what I was just describing a moment ago. Yes, uh, that speaks to what John Bell once asked me about is the Canadian problem. And yes, we do still have provincial issues uh, that limit uh, sharing. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that researchers can't get access to it. You can still get access to Canadian wide data. It just requires a bit, still a bit more legwork uh, with respect to getting access to those regional activities as well. Um, I'm just checking how we're doing here with time. Um, David Lillicrap has asked a uh, second question from David. What informed consent details are in place for reporting information back to individual subjects? Uh, our policy um, has been that we do not ref inter uh, return information back to our participants um, unless there's an incidental finding um, which requires that a participant um, be notified uh, almost immediately that there's something that has been captured in the data. Uh, but we do not say in return information, for example, on say, I don't know, 
ancestry, for example, back to our participants. There are ancillary studies that we support in the CPTP. That's what we call, say, projects where somebody might come in with, say, independent funding and they have they want to make use of the CPTP um, and say to drive, say, uh, like the MRI study that I had mentioned before, sleep studies, uh, question, other questionnaires that we haven't captured. And to some extent, information is not necessarily returned back to the participant, but the participant almost gets a sense of, of information to some extent from being part of that study. Um, Helen Doyle, uh, thanks, Helen. Would the CPTP also have, have sound bites? or key messages from your population cohort data that could be shared with health agencies and the media to raise awareness of findings such as linkages between health and environmental risk factors. Um, we work on those a lot with our communications team and uh, so we're, it's great to have Nicole uh, with us now and Nicole Bonner who's uh, driving our communications efforts and also working with our OICR and other communications leads in the, uh, across, uh, across the country. It was gratifying to see the Globe and Mail pick up on our uh, uh, pollution and genomics study as well. That seems to capture the imagination of media um, as well gets picked up. We saw that that got picked up with health agencies. I do want to say as well as that is in part being supported by a CIHR funded activity. Um, and, and that's a multi uh, institute activity supporting C uh, that research. Uh, including nutrition, genetics, uh, et cetera. I'm sure I'm missing, missing some people or some agencies and uh, my apologies. Uh, but uh, I, I think that that's really important. And I think it, it speaks also to the importance of making sure that government and funding have, um, be made aware of why it's important to maintain population cohorts over the long term so that we can address these things. And also to make sure that uh, Canada doesn't fall behind um, both with respect to uh, not just capturing information with respect to environmental exposures, but also with respect to genetics and genomics. Um, we've got a, just a few more minutes left. Um, Karina's back. Um, you, you mentioned a few diseases defined in the CPTP example, MS, uh, 1,743 participants. Um, are these defined using IC ICD diagnoses, physician diagnoses, or survey? Uh, what I had described earlier, uh, Karina, was largely data coming from self-reported information. But as I said, we do a fair bit of work um, validating that information with administrative uh, health records. Uh, I do want to say that certain things do really well with self-reported and some information is not. Um, even our experience with great cohorts like UK Biobank, cancer always, you'll always do really well with respect to information uh, being self-reported in terms of validating that. People are obviously well aware of the kind of cancers that they've been diagnosed with the exception, say, of skin malignancies. Um, things like blood uh, hypertension, less so. Um, and we, we see that in other cohorts uh, or other coronary or ca cardiovascular related outcomes. So I always uh, try to emphasize caution that self-reported information in that space tends to be less reliable. Uh, are there, Jason Lee's asking, are there outcomes such as hospitalizations, adverse drug reactions, et cetera? Uh, yes, um, there are. Um, that's also, that's somewhat dependent on the information we get from some of the, uh, from the agencies that I just talked about as well. Um, and as well, I wanna highlight Sasha Bernatsky's work uh, at McGill, who's got, who has received independent funding from activities like CHR to look at drug sensitivity and drug utilization. So she's done a fair, uh, she's ongoing and already done some great work cleaning up our drug utilization data in the CPTP. And we do try to capture information as well about uh, response to those drugs or how you respond to drugs. And finally, uh, and I think this is timely because it's the last question and I have one minute left and up. Oh, so uh, and see, does, do we have CP single cell RNA-seq data yet? We are collecting it. Uh, we've done our first five, uh, 400 samples and it's ongoing. Uh, it's, it's being part of, it's actually done as part of a project or an access request, if you like. Um, but as soon as that data is, is finished being uh, studied, it's part of a student's PhD project. Um, Alyssa Bader is driving that activity. Um, uh, it will be made available. And uh, we're hoping to use that information uh, to be join other consortium like the Single Cell Atlas. Um, and there are other activities in Europe that are collecting similar kind of information as well. So uh, I think I'll turn this over to Nicole now because I think we're at the end. Um, so thanks very much, very much uh, everyone for, for asking questions and, take, uh, and signing in. 
Uh, awesome. Everyone, uh, I think we'll, we'll close here. A perfect timing. Philip, thank you so much um, for uh, for leading us through today's presentation, answering the questions. Um, next steps, um, as I said, we'll make sure that these slides are available on the website, both in English and French, um, in the coming days. Um, we'll also look at all the Q&A questions um, and do our best to make uh, the answers available as well. Um, and finally, we're very open to suggestions and ideas for future webinar topics. I invite everyone to reach out and get in touch. Uh, the, our contact is info at partnershipfortomorrow.ca. Thanks everyone for joining us. Have a great afternoon. Bye everyone.